Greetings, open-handers. Wow, what alchemical and totally magical times these are. We've had two years where the shadow has revealed itself in society, and that's been a great bonus, actually, because it has brought up the unconscious handing over of power at an individual level that people have been experiencing. And, that, and that's brought with it a tr tremendous reflection. A lot of people now working through that shadow side. So that's great to see. But we're coming in, we're accelerating now. The shift is accelerating and therefore we must be prepared to accelerate with it. What does 2022 have in store then for us all? I mean, the key is in the numerology. And to me, it's a, it's a twin flame year. What is the twin flame? It's one of those walkers with twin blades, front and rear. It's telling me to be attentive to the presence of my twin flame. I guess that's why there's two spiders on my camera as well. As the soul comes into existence, into manifestation, it's notionally separating at the source. And part of it, like 50% of it, stays at the source. This is a gross misunderstanding in the spiritual mainstream. The twin flame does not incarnate. It is the other aspect of you, the, the unmanifest aspect of you. And so your, this aspect, this embodied aspect, comes into incarnation. And really the journey then is about reconnecting with the twin flame. You're experiencing the 3D reality, but you're transcending it. And as you transcend it, as you work through it, then you pick up the flow and the vibe of your own twin flame. And so the twin flame guides you on a journey through the external in life. And it's working to reflect to you an embodiment of energies that now need to, need to come through in your life. That's how the twin flame works. And so we've looked at regaining sovereignty and a lot of work has been done, but it must go further now. You can't just settle back because the shift is accelerating. And so if you tune into the twin flame and you really look for it and feel for it, then what's going to happen is you're going to be guided on a pathway externally through your relationships, through how you live and work, your job, your career. You're going to be guided and it's going to trigger and activate everything inside, all your fears especially, you know, that stop you from taking a certain pathway. All of that's going to come up. And then there's a decision for you whether to go forwards or not. And that's what's going to define 2022. You know, each of us is going to be faced with the most challenging circumstances imaginable and the most profoundly beautiful circumstances imaginable at the same time. One is furnished from the other. You process through the density, and as you process through, you're digging up those nuggets of gold, soul gold, and that integrates and embodies, and it takes you forward, and that's what builds your route, your pathway forward. It's not about intentioning. Who is intentioning? Only the ego. It's the soul itself which is wanting to flow. And that tunes in, that will tune into the frequency and the energy of your twin flame, if you allow it to. And that's going to be a, just a, an incredible dance. It's going to guide you through life. It's going to guide you on your pathway. And it's going to make 2022 a completely magical year for those who fearlessly embrace the guidance and the pull that is coming through them. And I say fearless, you know, but it doesn't mean to say that it won't come up. It doesn't mean to say that you won't feel this, you know, <laughs> what am I being invited to do here? And a reticence for that. That's totally natural. That's the, the ego and the shadow side, which is resisting or pushing it away. And what you've got to do is work into that, you know, not, not drop it, but see that as the gateway, as the opportunity of what now wants to reveal itself. So you learn to work into the fears. You learn to embrace them as doorways, as gateways, and you keep opening out through them. And this, is, this means that you identify less and less with the 3D physical world, and that's crucial for the shift itself. So we have this energy building, 
and, and the shift energy is growing, they're going to come through your life. You just have to sit, observe, witness, breathe, and it's going to come through you. And then you will get knowings and guidances of how to move forwards. That, to me, is what will define 2022. So how can the open hand energies, assuming you feel a resonance and a compulsion to engage with the, with the work, how can those energies help you? I thought what I'd do is take you around Open Hand HQ here on Wirial Hill in Glastonbury. I thought I'd take you around and show you a few of the figures that have been involved in the generation and creation and emergence of the Open Hand work over the 19 years it's been here on the planet in the shift. I think you'll find it quite intriguing because not a lot of this has been shared before. You know, I wanted to keep the open hand energy completely pure and beyond any kind of distortion or interference from old energies. And that was the agreement of the team, the group of nine, when I incarnated, that we would not bring those, those identifications and energies forward but just really work to come through in a pure way. But a lot of people are interested, a lot of people are asking, you know, what is open hand? Where did it come from? What is this, its inception here in the shift right now? So I thought I'd take on a little bit of a journey and uh, reveal a few things. See how you feel about it. I think you'll find it intriguing. And this, of course, is Kuan Yin, the Divine Mother of Compassion. She is the Open Hand Team Leader, number nine. And we were blessed to get this statue of her right at the beginning, or near the beginning, gifted to us by two beautiful people, Dave and Anne Evans, in South Wales. And Kuan Yin is all about sitting in the void in a very compassionate, loving way. There's two ways to come to the void. You can go through in a very catalytic, nihilistic kind of way. Everything's stripping down, breaking down. It's quite aggressive, it's quite full on. Or you can choose to surrender and just kind of drop back. It's like falling over the cliff backwards. And, and the Divine Mother then embraces you and holds you as you go down. And to me, that's, that's the feeling sense of Kuan Yin. She sits in the void and, and embraces you and holds you. And so she is central to Open Hand. She's a team leader. And you're going to see a lot more representations and figures of her as we go around the headquarters. It's very moving, just connecting with her. I trust you feel something similar. Now we've got the Shiva energy on board because open hand is highly catalytic. It's going to bring up your shadow side and help you work through it. But also we work with the Shiva because open hand recognizes the densities going on in the field, the intervention that's happened here on the planet. Shiva is not about judging those energies, not about polarizing because that doesn't achieve anything. It's about saying this is the realignment that wants to go on on the planet right now through the toroidal field and that all beings are embraced within that. But you have to be prepared to let go. You have to be prepared to let go of rigid positions and manipulation or control of the field itself. You have to be prepared to do that. And if you're not, well, the revelation, the revolution of that energy is going to stir things up beyond no end, you know. So we work with the Shiva energy too. That's highly, it's a big part of the open hand energy. Now some of you will recognize this figure from the workshops who usually adorns the, the altar in the center of the room. And this is a Tibetan Tara. What I like to think of is that she combines both energies. She, com she combines the Kuan Yin energy the Divine Mother of Compassion, the Divine Feminine. But also you can see she's got some real alchemy about her. And so she also works, to me, with the Shiva energy. 
And so when I, when I set up the altar, when I set up a works, workshop space, you know, I'm using this figure to call in those different energies. And it's very moving, very powerful, you know. You can embody, you can ground, you can draw those energies in. And, that, and that's why the work is highly catalytic and transformational. Hmm. The Tibetan Tara. Now here are three figures that many of you might well recognize from the workshops and retreats. Firstly, we've got Kuan Yin on the left, riding a dragon. And why so? Because she has that capacity to ride the density. And so it reminds us that she may be this Divine Mother of Compassion, but she does sit in the void, in the toroidal field itself, and so can ride the denser energies too. On the right, you've got Lady Avalon in this case. So it's a representation of Gaia, but because Open Hand is based in Glastonbury, then we're calling on, we're using, we're working with those energies locally. Just as we have, for example, on La Palma, when we work with Ila Bonita, and there was a, you know, a, a different energy, but some similarities too. The character in the middle is called DK, Dual Cool. And that was a previous incarnation of mine. And I haven't talked about that to date. And the reason I haven't talked about it is because I didn't want to taint the open hand work. This is a very powerful energy, no, no doubt. Very evolved energy, but it's been highly distorted as it's been expressed here in the 1930s. Very intellectual, the way it's been described. And, and the dual cool, the DK energy is anything but intellectual. It can be expressed intellectually, yes, but this is shamanic energy and not just First Nations shamanic energy, but it's, it's an interdimensional dialogue. It's where you're reading signs and synchronicity and connecting up the dots through the dimensions. And really then, because you're doing that, it's like you're instrumental in the transformation of the field all around you. And that's what the DK energy is all about. Now, when I came into incarnation here, I had agreement with the team. We, we said we wanted to drop the previous identities and that we would just go with numbers and frequencies and that we would bring the work forwards in a very pure form, hence the phrase open hand, which was non, you know, which, which was completely de-energized and an encompassing of all possibility. But I've gone through a big shift recently. You know, I let go of a lot of the DNA of the previous soul. Uh, you know, I came in as a soul exchange and it felt like it was timely to really share the heritage of open hand. But having done that as well, the other thing that I feel very strongly is having done that, having sharing that now, is to embrace it, yes, but then to leave it behind. Because all of this is form at the end of the day. And that's the challenge, that's the problem of religion, that we really need to transcend the form. And that's what DK was all about. You know, it was like looking at Tibetan forms, for example, Buddhism, shamanism, but then transcending and saying, right, how does my soul want to dance now? And that's what the DK energy is really all about. And it was much misunderstood, misreported, misrepresented. So initially I didn't want to bring it into the work, but I think it's, it's relevant now just to share what that is about. And so what people might expect as they come forth to do the work. What DK, what the DK energy is really exploring right now is the effect of dragon energy on the shift, multi-dimensional dragon energy. What is that? What's that about? And how can you call on dragon energy to transform the field around you? And that's what I've brought forwards from that understanding and working with right now. So it may, I don't know, it may look a bit egotistical to have a picture, a past picture on the, on the, you know, on the altar, but what it's done for me is reminded me of possibility that, that you know, this is what we can aim towards, this is what we can achieve, and then to let it go. And that's what I fully intend to do. <laughs> DK. Now we've got some other quite interesting things going on in the hallway. Hugh Bourne down there at the end, but also 
the altar here on the right, which I'll show you in a little while. But before I do that, I wanted to take you into the office and show you another couple of Kuan Yin representations, which are very, deep, very deeply moving and have been right from the beginning. So we're going this way into the office. Now this first figure is highly significant because I got her on the island of La Palma. And I'd gone there for a period of about 12 months, the purpose being to realign the open hand energies and bring them back to what they're always meant to be. And it was, it was a fascinating time there because I don't think people really appreciate just how it reflects into the bigger picture on Earth right now. So there was an, an original group that, that lived there called the Gosh, I think that's how you pronounce it. They lived at, completely at one with the land, off the land, completely at one with Isla Bonita, until the Spanish conquistadors came along and fooled them, deceived them, took their king prisoner and marginalized the originals there. And then followed a period of, if you like, industrialization with the banana plantations and spraying poisons on the island. Beautiful, beautiful, pristine. And, and to be then, yeah, contaminated in that way. And as I connected with Ila Bonita on a daily basis in meditation, you know, I could really feel her pain. Just as you can feel the pain of Gaia and what she's going through right now. And so when you think about what's gone on with the volcano, you know, a lot of people now feel completely compassionate towards someone who's losing their house and where they live and their history and everything else. But we have to reflect upon the fact that, you know, th these are very misaligned ways of living. And, and the earth, the planet wants to come back to the original configuration. The palm is a key stargate in this shift. I think it will be a very powerful lock and key. Many people think that it's all over. It's not. What I'm being shown is that the substructure of the island has been greatly affected. And on the 22nd of December here in Avalon, I was guided early morning up onto the tour and the sky was blood red. And I instantly knew it was an omen for what is to come, whether that be La Palma or whether it be wider field. I knew it was an omen. Anyway, I got this tremendous porcelain figure at a Sunday market on La Palma one afternoon, and I just knew she had to come with me. <laughs> now above the Quan Yin La Palma figure is perhaps my most memorable, and it came to me very early on, the first figure that came to me of the group of nine. And I'd taken on this small flat and meditating many hours a day in the studio. And this light being started to come to me and connect with me, very playful actually. There was a lot of kind of movement, dancing, explore, exploration and revelation going on. And in fact, in the early workshops, people used to see a purple light being at my shoulder. And there was one particular day and I, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, look, I'd really like to know more about you. I'd like you to tell me about what you're really about. And there was an instant recognition that was then going to come. So I jumped in my car and took off. And this very circuitous route led me out into the country and onto an industrial estate. Never been there before. And I instantly knew I had to go in to this particular warehouse, a used furniture warehouse in the center. And as I, as I got there, the guidance was, I've never experienced anything like it, it's unequivocal. It's like, right, we're going in through the door, we're going along the corridor, we're going up the stairs, we're turning right, we're going through the second door. And there was this tremendous feather dancer figure. And what you see is this, this figure twirling eight feathers. But actually they're not eight feathers when you look at it. Each feather is, is a twin. And that represents the twin flame dynamic. So what it's saying is that the group works as a team of nine, 
but each individual is respected and honored. Each individual still connects with their own twin flame. And wow, it's just like, whoa, this is deep, deep stuff to be shown that in, in that form, in that way. And so this picture has been with me ever since from the very early days. And really to me, metaphorically defines what open hand is all about. What a blessing, what a blessing. And down the end of the corridor, we have another figure that's been instrumental in the creation of Open Hand. And that's a psychic drawing of a chap called Hugh Bourne. Now in the 1800s, Hugh was a very humble carpenter, as I understand it, but then had a massive Christ awakening. And from that point, discovered that he could awaken people simply by his vocal sharings. And the Methodist Church, which was a part of the time, felt very threatened by this. And um, so they expelled him, along with James Bourne and William Clowers. And so they set up the Primitive Methodist Church, and they used to meet up on a place called Mao Cot, which has a kind of reminiscence of the Glastonbury Tour, but is much more masculine in energy. And they used to meet there in the 1800s, and within a very short space of time, they had a following of about 100,000 people. No Facebook, no social media, no Twitter. And yet, the essence, the energy of what they were about drew people from far and wide. Now, why is that relevant? Because I was with Chris, and he was at a spiritualist church back in, well, way, way at the beginning. It was before his own Kundalini activation. And the psychic artist had drawn Hugh Bourne, the Hugh Bourne energy, with Chris at the time. So it became my knowing understanding that this represented his higher self energy at the time. And, and on visiting there, you know, a number of times way in the beginning, you know, I, I could feel him, I could feel Chris, and what that was like, what that felt like to him. Literally, you know, tearful breaking down. This was the memory of something which had been really powerful to him in those times. And it's fascinating because Chris's family are antique dealers, or they were. And they picked up a sideboard one day, and in the sideboard were three commemorative plates of the formation, the foundation of the Primitive Methodist Church. And I still have those plates today. And although, you know, Chris has ascended, and we had an agreement that he wanted to do that. He wanted to move on. He'd, he'd had his fill of life here in this, in this plane. And we had an agreement between us that, yes, okay, I would support that. But he had to go through the five gateways first. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't support the work unless he transitioned through that. So really his early journey of a few years here, you know, that was all about establishing what the five gateways are, as a journey, as a vehicle, as a landscape for us to journey through. I think he did that admirably. I really, really do. And, and I know that Hugh Bourne was there in support all along. And, you know, even though Chris isn't with us right now, he is with us. He's with us in the ether. He's with us in the 5D. And, you know, I can feel it like a calling beacon. You know, I've been out doing energy work locally in the area recently. And, and a fox came to me, I mean, a real fox. And, uh, you know, that was, that was Chris's energy. I mean, it was, he had the Kestrel energy, but few people re realize or remember or recall that he actually had a lot of fox energy too. So this beautiful fox came to me, and I just knew it was Chris there with me at the time. And it was a beautiful, beautiful feeling, very moving. So we're blessed in the organization to have a strong representation of the Christ consciousness. And, that, and that's really about guiding us through the heart. And um, that's a major part of what the work is about. Hugh Bourne. But that's still not the end of the story. Because over here, on the other side of the corridor, there's some real gems.
to conclude with. There's so much going on. The question is where to begin. <laughs> Here's a figure that came to me not too long ago, actually, and it's a multi-armed Buddha. And to me, again, it represents an energy, a connection in the field. Openham works with many star soul groups. And so you have this energy in the field that's orchestrating, that's connecting, our community connector, so to speak. And that energy is connecting and weaving different star soul groups for a collective inquiry. Now, the observant among you may have recognized two things. Firstly, got a couple of necklaces here from La Palma. That's carrying the volcanic energy of the island here. But also, if you're really observant, you see the glass Buddha underneath the very bottom. What is that about? Intriguing. So one evening, I was watching the Blade Runner movie, 2045. And the, and the scene that tickled me pink was the scene where the old Blade Runner meets the new Blade Runner. And the old Blade Runner says to the new one, I had your job once and I was good at it. And the new one looks nonchalantly back and says, yeah, things were much simpler then. <laughs> and somehow it really connected with me because the thoughts, the feelings of how complex and how challenging the world is right now and how did you work with it? And that night the Buddha came to me and we had a laugh together, you know, said to me, I had your job once. Of course, a different job. I'm not trying to compare myself with a Buddha. I would never do that, of course. But it was a laugh. It was a joke. I had your job once. I was good at it. And, you know, I smiled back and said, yeah, things were a lot simpler then. The next day, our community connector, Tilly Bud, showed up. Now, she had no, under no idea of what I'd been experiencing in this, this tremendous dialogue, this dance around the Blade Runner film. And she brought with her, because she's highly intuitive, she brought with her the glass smiling Buddha. It was like, oh my God, you know, here's the, here's the synchronistic interplay, here's the representation, here's the reflection of what you were actually experiencing. <laughs> so that, that just tickles me absolutely. I'll never forget that. It's, it's one of those beautiful anecdotes. But again, it's still not the end of the story. So let's take a look. Let's take a look over. I just want to make, I have to adjust the camera so you can see it. Now this character is called Sri Yukteswar. He was Paramahansa Yogananda's guru in the lineage of the Kriya Yogis from the deathless Saint Babaji. And when I came here, I wanted to develop practices that would accelerate the enlightenment process in a straightforward, powerful, catalytic way. So I went and joined a Kriya movement and was going to go to the Fellowship of Self-Realization. But what they wanted me to do was to drop all individual practice at the time, which of course would have included open hand. Clearly I wasn't going to do that. So I was sitting in the studio one night, meditating and just expressing, you know, my sadness that I wasn't going to be able to practice these tremendous Kriya yogas and then Sri came to me and over a period of months showed me the power of the bow and of the chakra opening and attunements the kundalini activation and so through that engagement I developed those practices for use in the open hand work and he was always very keen to point out that we must transcend the form and not get in, stuck into the rigidity of it all. That was one of his main emphasis. And he came, he came recently too in talking about and helping introduce the Merkaba and Maya Samadhi, what that's all about and how we can transcend the physical and live in the Merkaba. So, so that teaching, that exploration has come to me in recent times through once more, Sri Yukteswar. Now, that's a very interesting figure because I want to show you the final aspect of this journey around Open Hand HQ. And it's a picture I've got on the wall right there. Now, this is a picture that came to me in Tintagel in southwest England. Very, very 
moving. It struck me at the time. I thought, wow, I just have to, I just have to get that. I just have to get that and, and uh, yeah, work with the energy of it. And what did I notice? Well, firstly, this is, this is Lao Tzu. And Lao Tzu is conjuring this blue dragon. And, uh, and it spoke really, really loudly. But then, interestingly, when I set this up a couple of weeks ago, and I dug out the picture of Sri Yukteswar, <laughs> something really clicked because I realized that that to me is not a representation of Lao Tzu, but Sri Yukteswar. And that the work of open hand is unleashing the blue dragon. And who is the blue dragon? Well, to discover that and work with it, you'll have to come on an open hand course or retreat. And it's going to speak to you. So we come full circle. And just to conclude with, I'll share a bit about the open hand work going forwards in 2022 from here. Hmm. From what I've shared today, I think you'll appreciate that over many years, open hand has been crafted to be a bridge, to be a catalyst, to be support for people's journey as we ascend into 5D. And that, and that work is coming into its fruition now. I really feel it gearing up. It's becoming increasingly relevant to the situation that's going on in the world around us. And it is the passion, it is our passion to share both in terrestrial retreats and also on Zoom. You know, do not underestimate the power of Zoom. A lot of people have said just how extraordinary it is they can feel the energies in their own space. And because you're in your own space, it means you can embody and, and work with it and, and not have to travel or journey to, you know, to a retreat center. So do not underestimate the Zoom work. We connect powerfully that way. We're still bringing in the open hand energies, so you'll get the full complement even on Zoom. But of course, it's also beautiful to connect terrestrially, to look someone in the eyes, give them a hug, feel the energies grounding around you. And so the field is opening up and we are beginning to introduce more terrestrial work. So if you feel that, yeah, that would be for you, come and get involved. The energies are perfectly crafted to meet these times of great change and transformation on the planet. I very much look forward to seeing you, connecting with you, and helping take your journey a step or two further down the path. See you down the flow. Namaste.